And I will raise up a faithful priest who shall do according to my heart and my soul. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Your Excellencies, Reverend Fathers, dear faithful, and dear Father Caleb's sons. It's a good day and a great feast for our first Mass. patron saint of parish priest says, the priesthood is the love of the heart of Jesus. How great is a priest? If the priest understood himself, he would die not for fear, but for love. But God spares us because of our weakness. And when Almighty God deigned to restore religion after the ravages of the French Revolution, whose foul heresies poison the air we breathe still today, our Lord did not choose an up-and-coming intellectual, nor a great preacher who could pack Notre Dame for his conferences, not a Laminé or a Lacordaire. They tried to reconcile the revolution to the church, an impossible task. No, God chose a simple priest who spent his days and his nights reconciling souls of sinners to God in the hot or cold and uncomfortable confessional of his little parish church of ours. And he's the priest who was always, almost, not getting ordained. And I think that God did this, St. Paul would probably say this, to confound the wise. And he it is the church gives to us, who take care of souls in some way today, as our patron. You know, he only got himself ordained, he was allowed to be tonsured and promoted to the minors. Well, it was Sede Vacante for the primatial see of Lyon. The cardinal, Fesch, had fled after Napoleon fell. And the vicar general came and just asked the priest who was trying to work with him just three questions. Is the Abbe Vianney pious? Is he devoted to Our Lady? Does he know how to say the rosary? Imagine that. His ordination examination was more demanding. The examiner came again, though, to see him, lest he should be nervous, and referred somewhat ironically to him as our theologian. But he remarked afterwards on the quality of his answers. And the vicar general told him, well, my dear son, if you can find a bishop to ordain you, things were so upset then, you may be ordained. And so he walked 60 miles with his alb and his lunch under his arm into Austrian occupied Grenoble, and there on the 13th of August, 1815, he was ordained a priest in what must have been a very simple ceremony in the chapel of the major seminary of the diocese. The next day, he said his first mass at a side altar with an Austrian army chaplain on one side and then the other, quietly offering their masses as well. Sometimes people would ask him later on if they could catch him outside the confessional, Monsieur Lebe, who is your theology professor? And he would always answer, well, I had the same teacher as St. Peter, 
Dominus solus dux eus fuit. The Lord alone was his leader. Our Lord chooses priests. That's how he did it in the 19th century. Holy priests. Some of them restored the great orders. Others founded innumerable congregations and uh, societies of clergy. But all of them belonged to one order first, the order of Melchizedek, into which our new priest was ordained only yesterday, a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, as the choir triumphantly sang as we left yesterday morning, to as sacerdos in eternum. Yesterday, our Lord fulfilled, in our seeing, once again, the prophecy he had made so long ago in the midst of an announced chastisement. We read about it, we priested, in our bravery one week ago, last Friday. It's the story I suppose by most forgotten or not known, of the high priest Heli, high priest of the tabernacle at Shiloh. He was not a bad man, but he could not control his sons, whose sacrileges and scandals drove people away from offering the sacrifice. And for this, our Lord announced through the prophet that his house and his line would be almost extinguished. But in the midst of saying all of that, our Lord said, I will raise up a faithful priest who shall do according to my heart. Between the Protestant Revolution and the French, you know that our Lord, that's the story of today's feast, you know that our Lord appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, 17th century France. And this revelation was given whilst the church was still suffering from the aftershocks of Luther's revolt. And in France in particular, they were chilled to freezing by Jansenism. The church was opposed by her own and the Lord's anointed priests and bishops and kings. And the church was scheduled, this is not the first nor will it be the last time, scheduled for destruction by the freethinkers, by masonry and the rest. Never mind. I will reign, he told St. Margaret Mary, in spite of my enemies. But it is as if God the Father says, what more can I do for them? And the Son answers, I will show them a sign which they cannot misunderstand, my heart symbol of my love for them. Not a devotion, one among many, but the devotion to the very person of the God-man, the worship of the Word incarnate, considered under the aspect of human love, of which the heart of flesh is the living symbol. This devotion to the Sacred Heart, of course, you know it. I hope you know it as well as you once learned your three R's. But there's a fourth R to this devotion. The first is simply this, to remember. Remember the infinite love of God. You are loved. Now that's encouraging. Remember to love, diligence, thou shalt love. 
And remember that God is not loved, not nearly enough. And second, because he is not loved, reparation. That's the story of today's feast. In the old days, the Blessed Sacrament would be exposed on the altar for the eight days, the octave of Corpus Christi. And the Sacred Heart desired that reparation should be made to him for all of the indifferences and the coldness, the contempt even, and the irreverence on the part of Catholics as well as heretics. Reparation, that's the story of our first Fridays, the communion of reparation, nine consecutive first Fridays. Thirdly, recompense, yes, reward. The 12 promises we read about in our books of devotion, but far more than 12, really, for those who simply practice a devotion to the Sacred Heart, which really does start with having his image in a place of honor in your home. And he, him, the king of love, enthroned there in your family. Then fourth, to reign. Our Lord must reign in his heart, in society. And that means it starts in the home. And that is the importance of the observed, of the lived enthronement of the Sacred Heart in our families. But what a task. But these are the means whereby the revolution will be overturned. How much, though, we need confidence. But it is here in his heart we will find it. For all of us, priests and faithful alike, for the great work which is ours again today to restore religion to a trampled vineyard. We have no common father. Christ has no vicar on earth. And those who should be our friends are our foes. For the faithful priest, the demands are all encompassing. The workers are few. What a scene greets a new priest at his first mass. The curé says, leave a parish 20 years without a priest and they will be worshiping beasts. 20 years, 50 years and counting. And still today, again, the patron saint of priests priest speaks Still today, when men want to destroy religion, they begin by attacking the priest. Because where the priest is no more, there is no more sacrifice. And where there is no more sacrifice, there is no more religion. But when God wishes to restore religion in our midst, in his mercy, he raises up priests. What a foundation has been given to us and to our work to have this seminary, which produces properly formed and trained priests. And though we seemingly have so little today to go on, what an encouragement for us are the beautiful approved devotions of the church, beginning with the Sacred Heart, with its extravagant promises and very modest demands in turn. The Sacred Heart, in whom the subdeacon sang it at the epistle, in whom we have trust and access, entrance in confidence, St. Paul's word. We all could use a little encouragement. You faithful, and some of you, I see 
here today, faithful for so long. And we priests, I mean the old ones, who have borne the burden of the day and the heats. And you, the young ones, ordained just the day before yesterday. We do not always see the ground gained, the progress made at the end of the day. Our faults and our failings stare us in the face. How many obstacles stand in our way? How badly we need the doctrine of confidence. And most of all, priests need this. The great Cardinal Manning of England said, once he finds himself in the rank of combatants, no priest has any reason to fear. Oh yes, the daily realization of our weakness, but we must always counterbalance that with the doctrine of confidence. Didn't our Lord remind us yesterday, after the communion, when Father's chasuble of charity was fully unfolded, Yam non dicam vos servos, what a touching moment. I will no longer call you servants, but friends. For side by side with the abyss of our miseries and the world's wretchedness is the deeper abyss of the divine mercy, the infinite mercy of the Sacred Heart, who goes so far as to promise his priests priests who are devoted to his heart, to have the power to touch the hearts of the most hardened sinners. What priest could ever walk that one by? We priests never forget, too, that our own vocation, with its so many steps and such turns, and perhaps detours, our own vocation is an act of mercy shown us by our Lord. Dear Father, Sons, today you will say, Quid retribuam, what return shall I make to the Lord as you sign yourself with the chalice of his precious blood? What return? Be a canal through which floods of mercy pour out on souls, souls most in need, souls who need to be saved from the fires of hell. St. Teresa of Avila said if she could, she would get herself a hut next to the entrance of hell to stop souls who were going there. And St. Therese, well, she picks off her great sinners one by one with her roses. And we, all of us, have the rosary. We have not yet plumbed its depths, nor known its, its riches. But most of all, it is by means of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, your Mass. The curé said about the Mass and the priest that he must have the same joy as he holds the sacred host as the apostles did when they saw the Lord, viso domino. And as for holy orders, he spoke of holy orders in the mass in the same terms. If we knew, we would die of love. At the least, we must live it. Our Lord demands a sanctity of you, Father, your mass by which you are daily sanctified, this divine reality, your Mass, by which you save souls and find the source of strength which you need everywhere, all day long, as a priest. 
There's a lot to do, dear Father. You won't have to look for long how to occupy yourself in the course of a day. But the only ones who do it well are those who are holy. Be a holy priest. Be a faithful priest. Be a priest according to his heart. God bless you. The day of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.